Okay, great. So thanks for uh, saying where you're coming from. I'm just going to start with our spiel. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us at our virtual gardening series for a year in the orchard. My name is Darby and I am located in Nanaimo, uh, Vancouver Island, BC, and uh, also known as Stanaimo First Nations Territory. And uh, yeah, just you've been talking about where you're from. You can stick your territory in the chat if you'd like to. And we'd like to extend our huge thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with Vancouver Island Regional Library on this program. Big thanks to Joanne Canning, who's also presenting today for her key role in creating the program with April, my colleague, whose screen is off, who's making all the stuff in the background work really well. And um, Richard Bernier, thank you. This is possibly your second or third year coordinating a bunch of adults, which is always like herding cats. Yes. Yes. But it always comes together. So it's really great. Um, so we have a few housekeeping items. Just a reminder that we are recording this session. We put it on YouTube and on our library website after. There's nobody's image or personal information in the recording. Um, so just our faces and names and things like that. And please use the chat feature like you're doing. Um, you might want to sort of chime in on things. That's one of the neat things about uh, these sessions and we have two of the master gardeners of our three Richard Bernier and Dorothy Kieser will be monitoring the chat. Joe will be focusing on our presentation which she will run through and then at the end if you want to put questions for Joe in the Q&A um, which is on the bottom of your screen that would be really helpful because we can sort of group your questions and make sure none of them get lost up in the chat history. Okay, I think that's about it. All right, so just a little bit about Joe. Senior Master Gardener Joanne Canning teaches and writes about sustainable garden, gardening and food security in our changing climate. She's an ornamental plant enthusiast and was a year-round urban food gardener for over 35 years. She's taught seminars at Van Dusen Garden, Horticultural Associations and Garden Clubs, VIU, that's our local university's master gardener training classes, and the Horticultural Technicians Program at VIU's Payne Center. Her articles and photographs have appeared in Canadian, USA, and international magazines. Take it away, Joe. Ta da Well, hello all. Um, here we are. Um, let's get started. It's a year in the orchard. Now, these are all images of uh, different trees that, that I have um, grown, most of them inherited. On the upper left, we have uh, the old pear tree and then a fig tree that I grew from a stick. And that's a frost peach that I espaliered from a stick. Cherry tree I inherited, apple tree I inherited, and um, a hazelnut, not a filbert, a hazelnut. Um, Little housekeeping on my end here. Um, we're the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners and we're in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Um, and there we are, dun, 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 dun. Now, um, the Master Gardeners Association of BC, um, let me move this here. There we go. Because um, it's in my way. There we go. Um, we're part of an uh, international organization, um, which actually started in the U.S. in Washington State. And um, as you can see, we're specially trained, takes us two years uh, to become a master gardener. And um, we work in partnership with both private and public sectors um, to promote science-based and sustainable horticultural methods and um, eco-friendly stewardship. Now this seminar is property of the, the two associations. So please do not copy it for commercial purposes, but please, please, please copy it, download it, um, share it all with your friends because it is science-based and it's accurate um, to the best of our knowledge, it's up to date. And um, to the left, um, I uh, wanted to show you 
the world's oldest living apple tree. And that's the Bramley seedling from Nottinghamshire. And it was actually grown from a pip and is still producing fruit. Now we've had a long relationship with trees and I think understanding this relationship is very helpful. Um, and look how long we've been involved with them. Um, the plums are the oldest domesticated fruit. There we are, 10,000 BCE. Then we come to figs and peaches, then apples, which I found quite interesting because although um, they were domesticated uh, in China, um, the, the Malas species, they were also interbred with the Mongolian crab to create the more, well, we'll say modern apples, but we have also wild apples in Europe and in North America. Cherries, um, quince, which was a far more important fruit than it is now. Um, it's a fruit that largely needs to be cooked, but it has a lot of health benefits. So very important in ancient times. Pears, of course, um, uh, two different types, um, one in China and at uh, a little bit later, um, archeological evidence discovered um, in Switzerland. Nuts, um, again, all were picked wild, but from archeological evidence, we also see domestication. And so they might actually be an older domesticated species than fruit trees. And then walnuts in Persia, which would be Iran and Southeast Asia or Southeast Europe. So the images here um, are all 500 year olds and older. The Endicott pear, which was planted in the original Massachusetts Bay, Massachusetts Bay colony in 1635, still alive the peri pear um, from Austria, and the Cubbington pear. And this is important because the um, Cubbington pear at the bottom here is actually the oldest wild pear. So it was wild, um, not domesticated, and it's still going strong and still producing. Now, we have three types of um, orchard trees. And they're, they've been a very important perennial crop um, because not only do they give us food, but they provide shade, lumber, um, and um, they provide bird habitat who in turn keep the, the, uh, the fruit clear of pests. And um, they also provide mulch and compost and they're very beautiful. Um, now, um, all across the uh, the Northern Hemisphere, um, they've always been an important source of uh, fat and protein and sugar. And they've always been gathered wild. And we still gather them wild today. Uh, just about three days ago, I um, harvested some uh, wild native plums uh, from here on Vancouver Island. And they had so much, uh, so much pectin in them that although I didn't have enough to make a full batch of jam, I found some fruit hanging over um, uh, my neighbor's fence. I picked it, I combined the two, and I was able to make jam just by adding a little sugar. So wild or domesticated for 10,000 years, they're still doing their thing. Now, the three groups of orchard trees, as you see, we have pip fruit. Um, those are apples, pears, quince. Um, nashi, which is just the Japanese word for uh, Asian pear, persimmons, medlars, and figs. Now, apples and pears are closely related. And I'm going to talk a bit about this botany because it becomes important. Everything about plants begins with botany. And I think understanding that for the gardener really helps us to understand why certain plants are cared for in a similar way. Um, now, those of you who grow roses um, know that um, their, their, uh, their needs are, are very particular, yet these orchard trees are actually um, 
all related to roses. And their related ancestry means that there's certain similarities that we can take advantage of. So we have the pip fruit and then we have the stone fruit, which technically is called a droop. So that's the center part with the big hard cover that we call a stone. And when it's small, we call it a pit, like a cherry. So we have peaches, nectarines, plums, apricots, and cherries. And they're all related in the prunus genus, but that goes back again to the rosacea family. And then we have the nuts. And um, here we have on the side some, keep having to move this picture. Um, here's the world's oldest apple tree in Lithuania. And here's the oldest domesticated tree in the world. And it's um, from Sri Lanka and it's a fig and it's in a temple. And um, it is uh, 228 BC that it was um, domesticated. And this last one, which is really cool, is um, what they call the 100 horse chestnut. Um, it's in Sicily and it's 4,000 years old and still producing fruit. And so this is a pretty successful group of plants to be in the wild, um, to, to be domesticated and to be still producing. And it's uh, the reason this uh, um, chestnut is called the 100 horse, not because it's a horse chestnut, because it's not, it's a sweet chestnut, but it's so big that when the queen of Aragon and her 100 horsemen were busy racing around Sicily, um, they encountered um, a very bad um, thunderstorm. And of course, they're wearing armor. Not a good thing to have out in a thunderstorm. So they all took um, shelter under this tree. And there's many paintings of this. Um, and, and so if you get a chance to see the old paintings, they're really neat. Um, so there we go. Now, there were also three other types of fruit trees uh, that um, are important for us. Um, we have the fig, um, which is actually inverted flowers, and they're noted for producing two crops a year. The, we have um, the mulberry, which looks like a mulberry, and we have the persimmon. Now, this really does look like a berry, but it's not. It's a group of droops on a stem. The thing to remember, uh, particularly for our American um, folks, is that in a lot of parts of the US, um, the silkworm species, which is the Morris um, alba, is invasive. But the red and black uh, mulberry, which are native to North America and have several hybrids and um, are originally from the Appalachian area from Georgia to, eh, can't recall how far north. Um, the um, Carolinian forest actually goes as far north as Nova Scotia. So all up the Eastern seacourt, none of those are invasive. Um, now persimmons, um, there are two varieties again. Um, we have the American uh, persimmon and we have the Asian uh, persimmon, which is Japanese. Um, they have a similar difficulty as figs is that they need a long growing season. So they often don't ripen. But if you um, have warm spots, they ripen. You can see the persimmon on a pergola and the fig in a pot. Uh, now let me see. Um, and of course, you know, the, um, the nuts, um, which I've spoken about, um, continue to be quite important. Now, in terms of seasonal tasks, which is where we're going to start here, um, it helps to understand that, that orchard trees are just like any other perennial. And if you get that thing in your head, it's really gonna help. Um, 
they are deciduous. So these are uh, this uh, far left one is uh, some of the apple blossoms from one of my trees. The second one is a cherry in midsummer. Uh, there's some seckle pears that uh, in a basket that I harvested. And there's the quintessential uh, tree in winter. And because they're deciduous perennials, um, you prune them in during dormancy uh, and you care for the soil the same, the same as you would any perennial. Um, and you control disease and seasonal pests. Now for fruit trees, the single, the single and arguably most important task in control is pruning. And I'm gonna talk about that in a bit because it's important in the seasonal cycle. Um, but let's look at first how we, um, how we walk through the season. Now, in the earlier slides, I talked about how long we've tended orchards. And um, I did that just because I love the history of food, but because it means three different things. First, we've modified these plants, like we have all food plants, to um, overproduce food um, relative to what their uh, wild uh, cousins produce. And we've done that through management techniques like pruning, hybridization, and grafting. Um, this means that if we don't manage them, they're not going to produce. And the second thing is that these trees have become susceptible to pestilence diseases, and they did that centuries ago. Um, and so they've evolved and we have helped breed them to be partially resistant and hardy enough to produce food anyway. So when you're dealing with orchard plants, perhaps if you think of the diseases that they're susceptible to, think of it like us learning to live with allergies. Um, I've seen century old trees that you don't know how they can be producing with all the canker uh, on them. And yet they just give you abundant fruit. So um, this also means though, that if we don't keep on managing them, they don't remain healthy. And um, most of our, our fruit trees um, were planted by a former owner and we've inherited them. And you've heard me say, this is a tree I inherited. Um, and um, they keep their maximum production for at least 30 to 40 years. And yet I've shown you trees that are a thousand years old that are still producing. Now, it's rare that the trees that you find are in good health or have been properly pruned, although I've encountered some that sort of amaze me. Um, but fortunately, because the trees have become very patient with us ignorant and uh, neglectful humans, um, I've also learned that with a little care and a little learning, um, they will return to the kind of beauty and production that they were meant to do. Um, and I wanted to say that because sometimes you'll find it overwhelming. Um, you know, you buy a new place uh, and there's this tree and you think, oh my God, it's too much. How can I take care of it? Um, but um, like I just, I just picked up some uh, fruit drop um, last week from a tree in a local parkland um, that um, is a hundred year old tree and is kind of neglected, but it's still producing fruit. And uh, my in-laws um, uh, renovated a 70, uh, a 70 year old homestead with uh, an old apple orchard, um, harvested that for 20 years sold it 10 years ago. And uh, when we revisited it, the trees are still producing. So as long as we manage them, the trees uh, do just fine. So when you, when you pay attention to that seasonal task of maintenance, um, you find out that fruit trees and nut trees are actually low maintenance uh, food crops. Um, in comparison with 99% of our other food crops like lettuce and broccoli and all those things, um, which have very high needs. But 
armed with uh, armed with all this background, um, we can look at these seasonal needs and um, the principles are the same. It's just that the plant is larger. So it's kind of like doing a mani-pedi on a horse instead of your toy poodle, you know, um, but it's still the same principle. And the key is in tree care, you have your seasonal tasks and the correct timing of those is absolutely essential. Uh, as long as you remember that, you'll have great success. So let's go on to winter tasks. Now here we have um, a, a fellow master gardener's uh, tree that she planted um, and it's 40 year old and it's a russet apple. And it's, uh, we photographed this, I think we were there in January. Um, that's not a bad picture. It is a Scots mist. <laughs> and so that's what the that's what the day looked like. And you can see the top growth on this plant. She's having to really work at balancing um, the health of this plant because it has canker. And on the left is another one of her trees, um, which is a cherry, very productive. And you see it's got a scaffold around it because each year, part of her seasonal task is she covers it against the birds. So let's look at what these seasonal tasks are. First of all, pruning of pip trees, biggest task of the year. And then of course we prune nut trees and we remove and dispose of mummies. You'll always have these little mummy fruit hanging on trees and they harbor disease and uh, fungal and bacterial disease. And so you always do your check um, to remove those. And then you dispose of uh, the diseased prunings. Um, you don't wanna be composting those prunings um, unless you can get your compost hot enough to kill everything. Um, most people, because it's winter, it's easy to burn them. Now, then uh, you prepare uh, the tree nets or the shade covers. Uh, if you have a fruit that is exposed to very strong sun, um, and you'll probably find this more um, in the so, uh, southern areas of the U.S., where the trees, um, when the fruit is at the top, they will get um, they'll get sun scald. But even here in B.C. in the Fraser Valley, um, which just to orient our American friends would be um, just north of the Willamette Valley in Washington. Um, friend of uh, a friend of mine uh, has a apple orchard of specialty heritage trees, and uh, she covers them because they will they will get sun scald, um, and they actually cook just the tops the top fruit. So you have to have those ready. Uh, and if you're using horticultural oil, um, and that's to smother the overwintering pests, then you apply it um, in winter. Um, one of the problems with our coastal climate here, and that when I say coastal climate, it's not just Vancouver Island, it's British Columbia, um, even up to parts of uh, the Alaskan Panhandle and all the way down to um, Northern California um, is that we don't get cold enough. Um, isn't that terrible? Um, I mean, there are like winters, uh, even when I was a child 70 years ago, um, there were winters where you didn't get a, a, a freeze. Um, and that's even more so now with our uh, warming climate. Um, and the problem is then that the trees don't go fully dormant. And if a tree isn't fully dormant, e even though it's dropped its leaves, um, you can have um, poor production the next year. And I mentioned this at the beginning um, where um, they don't get enough chilling days. So peaches on the coast um, are not a preferred uh, uh, orchard tree because 
we don't get cold enough on the coast. Inland in BC um, or at altitude, it gets cold. You have four seasons and the peaches do better um, as do the other stone fruit. Now also, um, the, we, we've got a lot more recent varieties that don't need the chilling days and they produce very well. I had a frost peach that was like that. Uh, now, the second thing is not only do we have short winters, um, we have mild winters, just referred to that. Um, and so pests are not always killed off. And so bad infestations can um, happen very easily. And uh, the most important thing is to take the measures in autumn um, to protect trees with a good autumn prep. And the third thing is that our winters are wet. Um, and that means that the plants are far more susceptible to fungal and bacteria uh, canker diseases. Um, and um, remember I mentioned taking the mummies off the fruit, off the trees. Um, and um, fruit trees all are susceptible to this type of disease more or less. And because many of our the trees that we inherit when we buy a place um, have been neglected, you'll see, oh my God, this is like terrible. What am I going to do? But as I said before, um, you can get them under control quite easily. Um, and that's been my direct experience. And um, even without toxic sprays, you can do it. You just have to be diligent. Now, timing is everything. So in winter, you really have to watch the weather. And um, that means that you can time the pruning correctly. Uh, often the windows of opportunity are like a week. So if you're going away for the winter, um, your trees aren't gonna take, get taken care of in that critical time after Christmas, um, unless you have someone to take care of that. Um, but once you get the hang of it, it's it's actually just fine. Um, now, we have the winter. Now let's look at spring. Now, spring is the busiest time in our garden. But the nice thing about fruit trees is that it's not a busy time for them. You do all your work in winter, and then come spring, the trees explode into blossom, and the pollinators and the trees do what? Grandmother Earth taught them to do. Um, now for stone fruit though, it can be a very small window, that time between late winter and, and early spring. The weather dries out, um, but the buds haven't burst open yet. And that's the time um, when you can do some pruning, be careful always that your uh, your your pruners are sterilized between cuts, um, and you have a lower disease transfer in uh, susceptible trees like say plums, um, and uh, so you can even do some of your stone fruits then. Um, one of the the uh, the things oh and that's that's one of my pears. Um, so in spring, I talked about, um, monitoring the weather. Um, not only is it for pruning, but for pollen viability, um, pollen is not viable, um, bef uh, below 40, uh, be uh, below 40 degrees and above, um, about 87 degrees. So um, that window um, makes a big difference. And I was chatting with Dorothy um, uh, earlier this year um, about her plums. And she had a gold, she has a golden plums in her orchard of many beautiful trees. And the uh, blue orchard bees um, were not flying yet. Um, because it was a very late spring, but the plums were busy. So there they are. And it got warm enough that their pollen was viable, but no pollinators. So she took out her little brush and went and 
hand pollinated uh, trees. And I've done that with kiwi fruit. Come on, guys, you can do it. You can do it. Um, and you make like a bee. And uh, so you'll get some fruit set where otherwise you might not. Um, and that's why um, I'm saying fruit set happens, um, but sometimes it needs some help. I had an apple. I had only one apple tree in this in this one yard that I had, and so I traded branches with a neighbor who also had one apple tree. But we were far enough away; we didn't know whether the pollinators would cross. And apples need cross pollination. So I had a big branch that I wanted to cut out, and he did too. So we traded branches put them in uh, each other's trees that were both in bloom at the same time, and we both got fruit set. Now, after fruit set, um, this is a very important spring task, and it's one I rather enjoy, and it's fruit thinning. So a tree um, produces more, um, more than it can actually bring to fruition, but it's gonna really, really try and it will exhaust itself. And with apples, you can get it so tired, it really won't produce the next year. It spends the next year recovering. So by thinning fruit, you get better harvests and you get consistent harvests. Now, um, studies show that uh, trees that have been thinned produce more poundage, even though they produce fewer pieces. They also produce better tasting fruit because the tree has enough energy for that. And they produce fruit that keeps better, of course, because they're higher quality. And the highest quality fruit is the fruit that keeps the best. So um, that's an important um spring job. And the other reason that you thin your crop, you thin that group of buds, like you can see them all here on the, uh, the pear, way too many buds, um, given the size that the pears are going to get. So you thin them. So you leave one, two, eh, sometimes three, but two to a fruiting bud. Um, and they won't touch. And that means that there's no place for pests to hide. So um, often you'll find like earwigs in your tree. Well, they're attracted to the coddling moth larvae and they actually predate on them, but they will hide in the cool, dark spots between the trees and, or between the uh, fruit and they will end up damaging both pieces. So that's why you, another reason why you want to thin the fruit. Um, also, when you thin the fruit, you get percentage wise beyond what it would normally do, um, the fruit drop, which we'll talk about in summer. Um, now, May and June on the coast, and I don't know how it is um, uh, inland, or further south, but May and June, coddling moth is um, a very deadly um, pest. And during the fruit drop, um, of course, the tree will rid itself of fruit that's not developing correctly. And um, that's when you monitor and catch, depending on how you're controlling your, your coddling moth, and you get rid of all that infested fruit. So let's look at summer. Um, now we have the uh, uh, second group of pruning that's gonna happen. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But for summer, um, we have this very important um, natural tree reaction that I just mentioned called fruit drop. Now, a tree produces more blossoms than it needs and it can't, can't feed all the fruit. And so it rids itself of the extras. 
particularly those that aren't developing correctly. And so that's why you want to pick it up. So if you're not used to fruit trees and all of a sudden you see a whole bunch on the ground, don't freak out. The tree is just managing itself, putting itself on a production diet. Um, so here we're emphasizing maintenance. Um, normal fruit drop, again, pest control. You just monitor the same as you do the rest of your garden and you um, water during summer. If you keep it, uh, your trees mulched all the way out to the uh, drip line, um, you're gonna keep your soil at an even temperature and you don't need as much water. Now, you also wanna keep that mulch about two inches away from the trunk. That helps air circulation and stops um, insects that you don't want there. It also um, does uh, stops mice or voles um, growing there. And keeping that little bit of space around the trunk, it also um, allows for ground nesting beneficials. And I've got that 70%. Of all our beneficial insects, almost 70% actually nest in the ground. So you need to give them room around a tree to do that. Now, we have pruning for size control in summer, not nearly the big job that it is in winter. We'll talk about that in a bit. And there's special pruning for peach trees, which we'll talk about in a bit. And we have pollinator care. Now, if you're using blue orchard bees, which a lot of people do, um, now is the time that you put them to bed. Um, they have finished that part of their cycle. They've crawled into their cocoons and you set them. You can leave them where they are, but you need to net them against predators like woodpeckers and wasps. Um, and uh, that's pollinator care. The neat thing about summer is that it begins harvest. So autumn. Once we get into autumn, um, let me double check my notes here and see if I've forgotten anything. Nope. Now, um, it follows the rest of your other chores. Um, harvesting, finishing off the season, and getting ready for winter. Um, now, if you're um, uh, growing pear trees, um, the neat thing about European pears, that's the Pyrus genus, um, Pyrus communis, I think, is the European pear. Um, they don't ripen all at the same time. And so um, you pick them a little green. In fact, if you leave a European, a European pear on the tree until it feels ripe, um, it's actually rotten inside. They're meant to be picked green and they ripen off the tree. So if you've got a good load of pears, you can go around and see the ones that are a little bit early, take those off green and they will ripen inside. And then a couple of weeks later, the tree is now freed up to take care of the rest of those pears. You'll get a bigger harvest. Um, and uh, with the nashi, the uh, Asian pear, you don't do that. They all ripen on the tree the same way as an apple. Um, so in autumn, here we have um, kiwi that actually, this is from a kiwi farm here on Vancouver Island, um, zone seven. Um, here's um, beaked uh, hazelnuts, uh, uh, coriolis. Um, those are the wild uh, variety that you that's found all over North America. And I thought that might be fun for you to, to see them. Um, they look very much like the European hazelnut, but they don't have that funny nose um, covering that the hazelnut or the filbert has. And the filbert is just another type of hazelnut. It's called a filbert. It's slightly uh, larger and it's earlier. And they call it a filbert because it ripens on the feast of St. Filbert. So that's when people knew um, when to start picking that variety. Um, 
and um, there's apples in the Okanagan Valley, um, which again is in British Columbia. And here are some more of the autumn tasks. You can see banding the tree um, with the cardboard and they've just got wires holding it. And if you pull that off, you'll see uh, all the little coddling moth um, larvae. And um, that's how you catch them. The moth comes down and these are really good places. Uh, and it lays, it lays its eggs and you get them before next year. So maintenance and winter prep preparation. So you're gonna rake leaves. Now, if you have disease, which most fruit trees do, you're going to mulch those leaves or you're gonna grind them up, make them really fine so there's lots of air in them and the fungus doesn't um, get a chance to grow. Um, but if you have a lot of it, then you're gonna remove it and you can put it in your compost Again, you have to make sure your compost is going to get hot enough. Pest control. So you remove all that fruit that's hanging. You dispose of the diseased fruit uh, and um, any materials, um, say dead branches or whatnot. Um, and you ban the trees if needed. And if needed, you also um, put cages around them. There are areas that have trouble with voles um, and deer. On a, on a, a bad winter, um, deer are browsers. They will chew on um, the bark of some trees. And then, of course, pollinator care. Make sure that they've been put away um, in a cool, dry place for winter. And always give your trees a good soaking. So just as the leaves are turning, just or when they've dropped and before the ground freezes, you give them a good soak. All that sap is going down into the soil and um, you want to get the, keep those roots nice and plump so they don't dry out. And then if you have any of the dead branches, um, particularly on plums and cherries, you can get rid of them then. And then you harvest, harvest, harvest. So um, always remember in harvest, pick those trees clean. Um, part of the reason is that if you've got raccoons, they will get into everything and they don't just stay in the tree. Um, and you don't ever want to um, be under a tree when the raccoon has decided it doesn't want to be disturbed and pisses on you because they will do that. Believe me, I know from experience, it's not pleasant. Um, bears also are extremely hungry and um, they um, will climb into trees, which is fine. But if you have dwarf stock, um, we lost a pear tree because the bear was bigger than the tree and the tree died over winter. Um, um, also a really another important thing that I learned um, uh, and I only did it once, but once was enough. Um, if you're processing your harvest, you've got all the um, berry wart, you've got the peels, you've got all this wonderful stuff and you put it into the compost, which is wonderful, except Make sure it's well mixed with lots of brown stuff. Don't just put it in a lump. I was too busy that one day and I thought I'll get to it the next day. And the next day it was too late because the bear found it. And he got into um, that center where all the berry stuff was. And of course the worms had already found it. So all the worms that I um, needed in my compost and bought for my compost had also migrated and the bear got the very good worm protein and all the sweets and tore my compost bin to shreds. Um, so don't do that. Now here I've um, given you some harvest tables and um, you will have those in your handouts. Now, for those that are 
watching um, this as a recorded session, always remember that one of the reasons that um, we put these things in is that you can hit your print screen and download these uh, slides. So if you want to go completely paperless, you can do that and you don't have had to uh, been registered on the original ones where we mail the handouts to you. So um, you look on the left here and you can see from early June all the way through late November, you can have some type of tree harvest. And the fig chart here on the, uh, um, on the right um, gives you um, an idea for the different, uh, different types of figs. Because figs produce two uh, crops in a year, some figs will favor that first crop, like the Desert King, and other figs produce um, a better second crop, like the Black Mission um, or the Brown Turkey. And I always grew the Brown Turkey because that was the uh, tree I was uh, uh, first given by a layering. Um, and uh, so I, there were years where I, most years, I didn't get a second crop. Um, Dorothy, um, uh, one of our panelists, she really likes the Desert King. It's also very tasty and it favors that first crop. So um, she doesn't have to worry about the second crop. But I thought this might be uh, interesting, um, particularly for those of us, look, we've got a Texas ever bearing um, uh, for our friend from Houston. Um, and what have we got here? Let's get on to the twice a year important management task of pruning and pruning and pruning and pruning and pruning and pruning. And here are some pictures uh, of the job um, from my friend. Um, this is winter pruning. So you can see that uh, uh, Mary is shortening to this bud right there. Um, and here is uh, from that 40 year old tree that I showed you earlier, um, a big chunk of branch that she's taking out. You can see the dark uh, spot here, um, which is the canker and that uh, part of the branch is almost half dead now and all the old uh, fruiting uh, buds. Um, here we have um, the third one is summer growth. And that's what we look at in summer, is that heading back. And you can see the pruning, a water shoot back. Um, this one is from um, England. So let's compare the seasonal pruning. Of course, um, you're going to follow your, your basic rules, um, which is DDD, D, dead, damaged, and diseased. Now, if you go to our seminar catalog um, in the library, 2023, one of our pruning specialists um, has a wonderful basic pruning workshop. And the dead, damaged, and disease applies to every plant that you're going to prune. Now, let's look at... Um, uh, this pruning in, in, a, in a very particular way and why we do it the way we do. Um, you're going to prune twice a year as a rule. Now, the best way to learn to prune is if you can find a professional pruner and follow them around and ask lots of stupid questions. Um, or an experienced gardener um, who's learned how to prune. Um, with, if you have a neglected tree, if you inherit a tree, it's often smart enough for the first year to bite the bullet and have a professional pruner come in and start the renovation of your tree. If you follow them around, you'll very quickly see what they're doing. And um, then you do the second, second thing that's best, which most people do, 
you get a book with good illustrations and you follow those illustrations. It's how I learned to prune different types of trees um, and it works. What happens if you make a mistake? So what? Trees grow. And unless you cut it off at the trunk, you're actually not gonna kill it, dear. Um, you're not gonna starve. You're not gonna kill the tree. It's just that it's gonna be a different tree next year at a certain spot. And almost all pruning mistakes become something else in year two and three. So don't worry about it. So the key to understanding is understanding the nutrient flow in a tree. We know that plants follow the rule of three. You grow when you're healthy enough, you flower, and then if that goes well enough and the pollinators are there, you produce fruit as soon as the tree is mature enough. For most of our fruit trees, it'll be um, usually year three because you'll buy a two year stick. So year three up to year five. Okay, unless it's a persimmon, which can take up to 10 years. So it has enough of this sap inside to feed itself. Now in winter, all that sap goes down into the ground. That's why we prune when it's dormant. So we don't bleed the tree out. So we don't open it up to disease. So in winter, we remove disease parts, prune off the non-productive parts, and by selective pruning, we increase the number of buds that are gonna produce flowers instead of leaves, and flowers mean fruit. So now, when the tree wakes up, it has all this extra sap. And what does it do? Oh goodness, I'm in the last stage now. I don't have to grow that much, I can produce fruit. And so it produces more fruit. And here's the thing though, you gotta be a little disciplined, eh? If we take too much off, when the tree wakes up, it sees, oh my God, too much is missing. I got damaged when I was asleep. So we gotta do lots of growth and like get back. And so we gotta take a step back. That's called vigor. That's green growth. That's those spindly green branches on top, like that third picture that I showed you. And they reach for the sun and their job is to create more photosynthesis. So if you do too much, you get too much vigor. And um, we call those branches water shoots. They're not productive, not this year but fruit trees and nut trees bear on second year. So you prune those, you shorten them back, read your book, you shorten them back, and they will produce a bud further down that becomes a fruiting spur. Um, you always need to have some because they will become the new buds, um, but you don't want too many. So in summer, you're going to prune for a different reason. So winter is your best time for the pip fruit. That's when you develop and open up the framework because you know what branches do. They just, they just like go for it. And so you open it up and um, that allows you to look at disease, to remove disease, to um, bring more light in to the tree and um, you can repair any winter damage. And then you can make sure your structure is balanced. Lots of our yards get more sun on one side or the other. So the tree does that. So you kind of have to balance that. Now in summer, it's more important for your stone fruit because you have to wait in order to prune. Um, for those because of their susceptibility to disease, especially peaches. Peaches are, um, they produce on second year wood only. So you prune them differently. But again, get a book, 
learn. I did. It works. This is when you remove disease and size control. So winter is structure and repair and summer is size control. Now, size control becomes far more important in um, strongly producing trees, particularly ones that are dwarf or that are espaliered. And you remove non-productive branches. So let's find out. Um, oh, and before we go to that, um, can I go back? I'll leave it up there. You can read that. Um, just a, um, a note on, um, on pruning stone fruit. And I'm just going to read you um, something about plums because um, the Royal, Halter, Royal Horticultural Society fellow um, said it just very, very well. Uh, prune when the when the plum buds are just bursting or when the tree is just beginning to flower. Establish plum trees that are more than three years old can be pruned in summer from mid-June onwards. Again, remember that the aim is to keep the tree a manageable size and shape while allowing enough fruit to ripen. So something um, about that. Now, um, here on the left is um, a tree I grew, which is called the Golden Spire, and it is a columnar tree, and we'll talk about those um, in a minute. Now, if you follow this um, questionnaire, I think that you will have a very practical um, way of going about choosing the right tree. Um, you have that in your handouts uh, and so remember, it is, first of all, what do you like to eat? You, you know, this is work. It's joyous work, but it's still work. And if you don't like to eat the end product, um, unless you've got someone that you're going to feed it to, um, it's kind of um, not going to be nearly as much fun. So again, research species, research your growing zone, um, and then understand how much time you've got to care to pick for fruit. So you're going to do yourself. Are you going to hire pruners? Are you going to hire gleaners um, uh, in North America, all over Canada and the U.S.? And um, as I understand, also in Europe, um, there are lots of gleaning societies. Um, and there are often um, people who are just doing volunteer work. Um, they don't necessarily need the fruit, um, but they are taking it to food banks. There are other gleaners um, who share the crop. So for part of the crop, they will pick your tree, they will give you part of it, and then they take the rest of food banks. Um, also, do you need extra pollinators? Remember what I said about uh, um, the apple tree? Um, do you do they need um, uh, something to cross pollinate? Um, do you want to think about maybe getting bobs if you don't have uh, pollinate enough pollinators in the area? And then always think of how you're going to keep the harvest. So there we go. Fresh in a root cellar, pickles, jams, preserves, freeze, dried. If you understand what you like to eat and how you like to eat it, that will tell you how you're going to keep your harvest and what kind of fruit you're going to grow. And are you really going to take the time to learn um, how to keep that harvest? Um, an important thing. Um, now, the final section in the seminar is um, managing your trees in the real world. Now, we all talk about orchards and, oh, God, I love to go visit um, Dorothy's Orchard. And not too long ago, um, I sat in the kitchen of another friend um, and just chatted as she as she uh, processed all the cherries off her cherry tree. And um, because that's how I was raised both in city and in farm, um, on my grandparents' farm. Um, it's a very, um, uh, very nostalgic and important, as well as creative um, time to spend. And even now, uh, when I live in a condo and I'm all crippled up, um, I made some plum jam. We don't need a lot anymore, um, but it's a sane way to live. 
um, harvesting your own food. And um, yet we have to deal with the real world. So how are we gonna do that when a lot of us now live in smaller spaces? And um, so I'm gonna introduce you, if you don't already know, um, about a technique called espalier. Sounds very fancy, French, you know. Um, but it's actually from the Italian, um, uh, spalliera, uh, which means um, something you're going to lean your shoulder against. <laughs> now, a spallier tre trellises or scaffolding, <clears throat> one moment, <clears throat> excuse me, are easy to set up. And um, um, I personally have found the espalier trees less work than, than trees in the round in many cases. Um, and as I've aged, um, having espalier trees and trees in containers have allowed me to harvest a lot of fruit in small spaces and use less water while I'm doing it. So let's look at, uh, and we'll get back to this uh, picture on the left of one of my old um, columnar trees in a moment. Fruit in small spaces. There's a fan peach and there is an espalier cherry. And I just love this third one. Look at that. So this is a farm and you'll see the fields and they've grown these very tall apple trees um, in columns and strung them out along on wires and the animals can't get to them and it's really neat because actually off to the left is the house and look at the shade that's created against the house without putting shade on the grass of the grazing area. Um, and this has been going on since Roman times, um, this espalier technique. And this last one on the right is really fun. It's called a Belgian fence. First one I saw was at the University of British Columbia, and it started, you'll see the uh, tree trunks there are quite tall, um, but they were only maybe, oh, 12 inches. And then they started um, taking the branches and creating this um, cordoned pattern. And you couldn't get through it. It was a true living fence. And because it's flattened, you get all that sun on both sides and it's called a Belgian fence. Now they save space, but remember they need some type of permanent support. It's not all that arduous. You can see um, they've got um, the house there with the Belgian fence and they have simply pinned those branches. Uh, and the fan peach on the far left, you can still see the training sticks so they've got the wires, but they have the sticks tied to the wire. And so then they can um, train those young branches. And then you can later, you take the wires out and the fans um, will be almost self-supporting. And you can see um, how all the fruit is on the inside uh, rather than out on the tips. And that's the thing about peaches, you see, they always produce there, and then they they um, uh, next year they'll be on the outer one. So they take a special type of pruning. So it is an old technique. The Romans began it. Um, really developed in um, medieval times. Um, they all have a central stem. You take a look. You see everybody's got a central stem, and then different tiers of horizontal or radiating uh, branches that you can create different designs. They all require the biannual pruning and they're used for decoration and fencing as well as food, which I've mentioned. They can be small or really large and you can see how big they can get in some of these images and yet um, the uh, patio one, which is the second from the left, is not at all um, a large um, tree. So um, 
the other thing is that you find in um, if you do any touring in Europe, you'll find courtyards and cloisters where it's very, very small areas. And yet they will be covered with espalier trees. If you're going to do it, you can see the uh, stuff on the right here. Plan first. Make a scale drawing so you'll know your correct trunk placement and measure that and write those measurements. And then you can design your shape um, and then you can refer back to your drawing whenever you wanna prune it. Um, I made a big mistake on my first peach because um, I didn't read the book and I espaliered it horizontally like an apple. And it really doesn't work very well that way. But as I said earlier, you can change mistakes. And um, I simply rewired the whole thing. And I lost a bit of uh, fruit the next year. But the year after that, I had a fan. As a matter of fact, two fans. I had a low fan. And then it went up over the uh, doorway. And I had a tall fan. And it produced 20 pounds of peaches from its fourth year onward. And this tree was oh, maybe five feet tall, but it was a good 15 feet wide on two heights. So measure and build the supports before you plant, heights and width. Know your space. You can keep your tree inside that space. That's not a problem, but know your space. Use the correct fasteners. Use permanent uh, wire or rigid supports, and you can see that both have been used in all these four pictures. And you can make use of large planters as a base for the trellis, the way the second image here um, on the patio, this is a planter it's sitting in. And um, always tie your branches loosely because they swell and they need to move. Um, use twine or, or, or plastic um, uh, horticultural um, coated wires or zap straps. Um, and Never use um, um, hard wire. Um, create your sturdy frame. Um, or, and look for nursery plants that might already naturally kind of have a suitable growing pattern. Now, you can change those patterns, and that's okay. But if you know that you're going to have um, something that you want three tiers with, look for branches that are already trying to do that and then train those accordingly. Um, you can see on the lower left, you see the tree naturally had some lower branches. They took out the, the central leader there. You can see that bare spot in the center of the, of the brick wall. And they simply fanned out these secondary branches to make your fan. So choose it um, uh, in the nursery if you can. And um, here are some of the designs that can be used in the spalier. Absolutely amazing. Now there's a very interesting one just above the copyright uh, um, uh, line there, number 18. Now that's a freestanding tree that's been trained kind of in a bowl um, and rather than the usual shape of a tree. So um, it is more productive. Now, there are two extreme shapes in espalier and you'll notice that these drawings all look two dimensional. Um, that's because the tree is actually two dimensional. They're, they're flat and um, now let me see. They don't really have the straight cordon, which is just a column. You'll notice like number nine, they've got several columns. Um, Hi, Joe. Sorry to interrupt espalier shapes. They're very cool. Uh, we're at quarter to eight. Okay, good. And um, I grew um, columnar trees in barrels. Uh, they're easy to maintain, and they're actually a, um, a natural um, mutation that was uh, discovered in um, Kelowna, BC. Um, now, remember that fruit trees um, train well. 
they don't grow out of their space and um, it's easier for the sun to penetrate them. They're easier to cover um, against the weather and for pests. And you can also create salad trees from uh, espaliered uh, trees. In other words, a, one type of plum, one type of plum, one type of plum, and you, you have several varieties. Um, so here we are at the end, um, a few minutes left for uh, Q and A. Um, you'll see here that we have um, lots of good reads from the library. And here we have a whole series of um, good, um, reliable, scientifically based um, websites that you can visit. Um, so there we have, and that is a cherry tree from the Nanaimo fish hatchery in bloom. Um, and what kind of questions do we have in the few minutes left? We have three questions, Joe. We have one from Nicole. When is the uh, when in the winter should pip trees be pruned? Well, that uh, um, uh, as the buds begin to swell and before they burst open. Um, is that uh, Dorothy? Is that probably the best description? I think that sounds very good, Joe. Um, I'm of the belief that I do it when I have time. <laughs> I'm very pragmatic about these things because as Joe has pointed out many times, uh, nature is unbelievably forgiving. And so if you do it at the wrong time, well, you know, that's maybe not ideal, but you'll get away with it. And certainly you'll learn as you're doing, making some mistakes. But I think Joe was very right. So uh, relatively early spring, um, when the buds start to swell, is when I prune my fig trees. And there's some excellent videos. I didn't see whether um, the my favorite one of fig trees is on the company in uh, Saanich, BC, um, that's called Fruit Trees and More. And they have the most fabulous um, experimental or rather video in terms of how to prune trees in general, but fig trees in particular. So if you're wondering about fig trees, look at the Fruit Trees and More. Fruit Trees and More. From Santa. Fruit trees and more video. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Thanks, Dorothy, because um, my list didn't include that. We also have a question from Elle. What is the correct uh, way to pick an apple so as not oh, to, an to, tear off the to uh, actually damage the tree? Right. When the, when the apple is ready, it will let go with a little uh, coaxing. So you'll find that it'll want to move when you hold it. So there's the, there's the apple here. And then you turn it upside down against the stem and it will come off. Exactly. Um, That's what I find too, Joe, is, is if you turn it a little bit and then upside down it, then it will let go. Because there's actually a layer called an abscission layer um, that forms between the apple and the tree. And at that point, it'll break off if that layer is sufficiently formed and uh, twisting the apple up will really help. Okay, we have a question from uh, Sabina. Uh, Joe, wondering if espaliered fruit trees end up with different weaknesses or disease. I'm asking because it somehow looks unnatural to me. Also, do all the fruit trees more or less tolerate this type of treatment? Thinking of bonsai here. Thank you for the great info. Oh, okay. Um, three three bits. Um, uh, yeah. Any any uh, domestic plant, if you look in the wild, it, it doesn't look quite right. Um, uh, it's been successful since the Romans. That's a long time. And my own experience with espalier trees, I've done and espalier trees of people I know is that they seem to have less disease. And I think it's because you manage them carefully when they're younger and because they naturally get more light and um, they're up against a protection, uh, they seem to have less disease and fewer pests. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, thinking bonsai is quite correct. Bonsai is nothing but an extreme way of miniaturizing a tree. 
And yet the principles, as I said in the beginning, always apply. Um, yeah. but, uh, you, you, uh, you keep it, yeah, you keep it in a smaller pot. And if needed, if need be, you trim some of the um, roots when they push against the pot, you trim those back. That helps keep the tree small. Um, it's not a, it's not a lot of, uh, not a big deal. It's not a lot of work. And um, it produces, yes, a stylized form of a tree, very beautiful, particularly if all you got is a small patio to have a tree that's as beautiful as this big cherry blooming right in your face in a giant pot. Yes, it's very the, other, useful. the other thing is when you espaliate it, you actually narrow the tree down so there's more air movement around the leaves and everything else and the fruit makes a lot less disease uh it makes it more disease resistant also on some fruits you can espalier them up against a dark wall or a house wall in particular we're talking nectarines and peaches where they need that extra heat to actually set nice fruit also, it offers you the ability to cover the tree along the top in case you're worrying about a peach leaf curl, which is quite prevalent here on the island. Right, completely right. Another uh, sub question of that was can nut trees also be espaliered? I haven't seen them espaliered quite as often as fruit trees, but yes, they can be. You'll notice that. Um, that picture I included of the hazelnut it was actually a wild hazelnut that someone had tied up along a fence. And yes, they can uh, very successfully be um, espaliered. Although I must say, I've never seen an espalier chestnut. It's a giant tree. Um, and I've never seen an espalier walnut. So um, I have seen espalier hazelnuts. Um, have either uh, you, uh, Richard or Dorothy, seen very many espaliered uh, nut trees? No, I haven't. I've never seen any, but I mean, theoretically, I could imagine that it would work. Yeah. Yes, I think it's. I think it's just that, uh, particularly, say with with hazelnuts or uh, chestnuts rather, and um, walnuts. They're so valued as a specimen, and they're so beautiful when they're big. And they create so much shade that they're grown for that. Right. Rather so, than just the fruit. We have another question here. How big of a barrel did you grow apples in? That was your colonnade apple. I can answer that question. I've had them before. Mm -hmm. the, the, the barrel doesn't have to be like a half barrel. A yeah. long barrel, half barrel, or uh, when they make uh, whiskey in or whatever. These trees are on a dwarfing rootstock. The rootstock is not very, um, it's more fibrous than it is, uh, has large roots on it. S the other thing I've known about these trees is if, as it grows taller, you have to give it some support in a pot. If you don't, the roots are quite uh, fibrous and the tree will blow on the root on the, in the pot and actually weaken the roots. So a good idea on this is actually to put some poles in there to steady it. Quite right. And because the, uh, the, the columnar trees um, uh, bear very close to the, um, uh, the trunk, they have very short fruiting spurs, as I as I said. They they're a natural they're a natural mutation that was found on a branch in uh, a Macintosh orchard in Kelowna, yes. in uh, and it was patented in 1978. Um, but because they're um, very very tall and very narrow and very heavy, they will fall over in a barrel. But yeah, I grew one of mine in um, the half a whiskey barrel and I grew another one in actually a smaller, um, gosh, it was uh, uh, maybe 20 gallons. Um, and it didn't do as well because it, it, it needed more soil and it needed more care and it was more susceptible to either getting too wet or too dry. But um, yeah, they're, um, 
uh, they're quite successful. And I found that my golden sentinel apple was very tasty. Which variety did you grow, Richard? I had uh, the scarlet sentinel and the mm. golden sentinel, both. Right. And I found that the trees actually bore in bore. different areas. So I always had um, a, a full harvest off of one of the trees. Right. The thing is, on these trees, a lot of them suggest that you bring in a secondary tree to cross pollinate. You'll get a better fruit, uh, more fruit set, and larger fruit. Yeah, which is your which is the the thing with any apple. They they need they need a a, a pollinator, um, and even if uh, if you can get a crab. Um, it's an, it's a universal pollinator. The key with apples is they have to be blooming at the same time. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Zoe has a question. I inherited uh, an espalier peach, which is now at a whack complete. How aggressive dare I be to retrain? Just start, uh, or just can I start again? You have to be careful because yes. if you too much at it you'll end up with water shoots all over the place no fruit and it's difficult to do put yourself put yourself on a two to three year if it's a if it's a mature tree you can bring it back again peaches are pruned a little differently get a good book i love the cavendish pruning book um and there are others that are listed um uh, in the library list um just get one that's specific to peaches and give it a try and be patient. You're not going to do it all in one year. I successfully took uh, a crab apple tree, a dolgo, which is a Russian variety, very tasty crab apple, from 25 feet to about 12 feet. Uh, and it became totally productive again, uh, where it was totally overgrown. And uh, but it took me three years and okay. I did it by tying colored yarn to the branches. We have so, another question. And that, and that you can do with your peach. What do I take out first? What do I take out second? Yes. Another question from Elle. I'm interested in a dwarf uh, cordon apple tree grown in a container. Can you expand on the type that will grow, how tall they will get? And uh, goes with the previous question. That uh, that sounds like a columnar is what you want. Yeah, and they can grow. The last ones I had were about, I'd say, 11 feet, 12. That's about the max height, yeah. yeah and they were in the ground. So it is, uh, yeah, when it gets that high, you definitely have to add some, uh, some support. Yeah. Support. We have a question from Jerry. Talk about rootstock. Jerry, this is a opening up a can of worms. There's so many. <laughs> the simple, the simple answer is one that I really saw um, the in-depth experience um, that when Dorothy and um, a master pruner um, uh, Barry Agar were talking um, about their trees and the health and the longevity, and um, they used to always put things on what they called a mauling nine. Um, so it kept the tree very, very small, but it reduced the overall health and vigor because of the type of rootstock. Now they'll put them more on mauling 26s, makes a slightly larger tree. Um, I think a good question, answer to this is why don't we actually do a presentation on rootstocks? Good idea. Let's do that. that. That way we can get all the different rootstocks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Trees yeah. Are actually can be interspecies. There's a few trees that will work that way. Yeah. Okay. And also, if you're um, to, to finish answering the question, um, almost all of your fruit trees are on some type of um, stock. And you're going to buy those from your garden center you ask what stock is on this, what are the weaknesses of the fruit stock, and um, how big will this tree naturally grow? 
Any any other ideas, Dorothy, on the rootstock? No, I think that's very true. But I think there's a lovely little book called How to Prune Your Apple Tree or Your Trees to Be Small. And it's probably available through the library. And it gives you very detailed impressions that even on some of the rootstock like M26, which is a more uh, sturdy rootstock, can you can still keep the trees at a reasonable size so you don't have to have a big ladder or anything like that. It's a it, question of keeping it going. It's called Grow a Little Fruit Tree and it was on Joe's list of recommended books. Thanks. Right, it's it's a lovely little book. Now the yes. other one is a question from Al again. Do all fruit trees need poll pollinators? No, no. Um, Dorothy um, has a cherry tree called a Stella. It's self-fertile. Um, all apples need a pollinator. Some plums are self-fertile. Some need a cross. Find out the variety and then you'll know. And then make friends with someone with a compatible tree. Um, <laughs> that way you're going to get one variety. They'll get another variety and you can trade fruit. The other thing right. is you've got some neighbors that have uh, a fruit tree within uh, your neighborhood, like maybe 50 feet, 100 feet or something. There's a lot of pollinators that actually go from yard to yard to yard. So like I said, sometimes it's not needed, but if you're out in the middle of the woods, you might need a pollinator for that. And the, uh, the Green Thumb Nursery across the street from the library where I am, they have this big binder. So when you go buy a fruit tree, it tells you if it needs two or three different pollinators and which ones um, flower in the same compatible. time. So some garden right. centers really have helpful resources if you're feeling overwhelmed. Okay, so I think Stephanie is just saying that she would like us to do something on mm -hmm. um, fruit stalks. And yeah, I will write that down and put it in my notes for a follow-up. Any more, any more questions? Can I can I ask one with a tiny answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't want to keep everybody. So horticultural oil. Okay. Do you, I have got ones that when I went to buy it and I knew nothing about my pear tree, it was either just the mineral oil or is mineral oil plus sulfur or mineral oil plus poison. Okay. Um, horticultural oils are one of our um, oldest controls and actually one of the most benign. Always remember that if something is called a pesticide, the C-I-D-E means it kills things. Okay, that's what it's meant to do. And the most important thing is, do you need it? Can you get by without it? Um, if you need it, you need to know when to apply it. 90% of all sprays um, don't meet the target that they're trying to kill. Now, horticultural sprays are meant to smother overwintering pests. If you leave it too late and the, and the leaves have begun to open up, you're gonna smother the leaves. So you see timing is very important. Um, the horticultural oil is a strict smother. Um, the sulfur um, and the um, Bordeaux oils, those are all, um, they're all um, uh, mineral mineral based um, pesticides that are geared to control fungal or bacterial cancers. Um, and um, generally, you can get away without using them. Uh, um, sometimes, and I had one tree that needed it all. And it was in bad shape, but I was determined. And so one year it got that, managed to slow things down enough that I could with the um, more benign management techniques um, take care of the tree after that. Um, so the other thing I'm thinking of is, uh, I'm just thinking here out loud that perhaps mm -hmm. we should do integrated pest management also. Yes, yes. And, and the integrated pest management is really is the key. Um, and you really find with things like orchard trees that it is paramount to know the timing on what it, or uh, identify the pest, identify what part of the pest, what, what stage is dangerous, and then be able to 
catch it with the right type of control at that stage. Right. Um, and even things like birds. I had a tree infested um, that I inherited the next spring. I've got the leaf rollers. They're just coming off the tree. And I'm thinking, oh, great, I got to go pick. And then I see two birds that just nested. And within two days, they had eaten all the caterpillars. So the important part of integrated pest management is observation. I didn't have to do any work after all. <laughs> I think good, uh, good pest eaters. Yes. As a matter of fact, Rob, robins, I read, can only, robins can only eat caterpillars when they're in the nest. Oh, yes, yeah. I think we're we're far too quick in terms of spraying things and using pesticides, because if we have a few pests, after all, the birds have to live on something. And when you read some of Doug Talmy's work, um, you can see that uh, even if you get a few holes in the leaves or if you get a little bit of this or that, let yeah. the birds have their go at it, just like Joe is suggesting. Yeah. And I always, always um, in my yard have some kind of nest. I know what bird is going there. I attract them um, with nesting and with different foods. And they do the majority of the pest control in, in, in a garden. Them and of course the beneficial insects. But um, really with orchard trees, um, make friends with bees um, and make friends with birds and they will control everything. Um, and not only that, I mean, the, uh, um, the chickadee um, and the sparrow um, eat 90% um, of their weight a day in mosquitoes. Yes, I'll take it, right? <laughs> um, any other questions? No, no other questions that I can see. I'd just like to remind our the people who are watching that the next uh, presentation is on lawn care and lawn alternatives. And it's with Cameron Smith, uh, another um, VIMGA member. And that's on September 9th. Good. And Dorothy, any, uh, any more comments from all your many, many years of your orchard growing? No, just uh, do what you can, enjoy being out there and enjoy the harvest. Okay. <laughs> so thank I you. We're done, Dorothy, uh, 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 Darby. Thank you so much, Joe. Joe's always got lots of enthusiasm and knowledge to go with any topic. And thank you, Richard and Dorothy, for helping with the questions in the chat. So we send out the video as soon as we get it processed. Often it's the next day, so we'll send that out along with the link with the handouts that was also in the chat too. You can always go to the library's website, virl, V-I-R-L dot B-C dot C-A slash gardening. And you've got info about our seed libraries and things like that too. The 